to turn in your Bibles today for a few minutes, if you will, please, to the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament Scriptures, the book of Nehemiah. And if you have a Schofield Reference Bible and you'd like to find it hurriedly, that's page number 549. Page number 549 in your Schofield Reference Bible, the book of Nehemiah. Thank you again for being in your places today. Good to see all of you. And I hope you've had a wonderful week. And I hope you'll have an upcoming good week. The Lord has been good to us. And we want to recognize His goodness and His mercy. Are you glad you're saved? Amen. Really? Amen. 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 How many of you are looking for the rapture? How many would be glad if it just take place right here, right in the service today? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't it be great to go out together? That'd be great. Have the big meeting in the air, big homecoming. It's going to happen. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we just talked about it and all of a sudden it happened? And we just go up? You say, what's going to happen to the roof? Who cares? Who cares? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the dead in Christ shall be raised, incorruptible, the Bible says. And we will have a new body. Until we get the new body, I'm trying to ha get us to have revival. And I've been bringing a series of messages on it, and I want to bring a message today on revival at the water gate. Nixon's name is not in here. Years ago, I had somebody to say to me, Preacher, I was reading my Bible today, and I came across the word Watergate. What does that have to do with President Nixon? That was years ago. I said, nothing. It has nothing to do with it. But, you know, I can never convince that individual differently. They said, well, that's in the Bible and it's on the news. It's got to be, there's got to be a connection there. Could never, I could never get them to understand it. But I want us to learn some things today from Nehemiah chapter number 8. I begin reading in verse number 1. And all of the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand and the ears of all of the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood which they had made for uh, for that purpose. Now, Lord, I pray that you will help us to understand some of the traits and the characteristics of a great movement of your presence upon the city of Jerusalem. Lord, we long for a great moving of your spirit like we read about in yesteryears. And we realize that if we don't have it, it's not your problem. It would be our unreasonableness and not positioning ourselves to receive all that you have for us. And I realize, Lord, that all you have for us far supersedes 
anything that we could ask or think. And I pray for our country. We realize as a nation we need a staring from heaven. We realize as churches we need a staring from heaven. As individuals, we need a fullness of your presence and your power upon our lives. We acknowledge to you today our need. We acknowledge to you today, Lord, the, the need of the, of the fullness of the power of your presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit upon our lives, that men and women, boys and girls, once again, might tremble under the influence of heaven. And in our service in these few moments, speak to us again and help us in a special way. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. I want to ask you in your Bibles today to turn back with me to the first chapter of the book of Nehemiah. And I want to set the stage. I want to give us the historical account to bring us up to our passages of Scripture today. Because of the sin of the nation of Judah... God has allowed the enemy nations to come and carry the people of the southern kingdom off into captivity. The walls of the city had been destroyed. The buildings in the city had been burned to the ground. And a huge number of people had been killed. Multitudes of them carried into a foreign country. And even though they're in a foreign country, their thoughts go back to, to their home, Jerusalem. And one day, a man who had been at Jerusalem came by Nehemiah, captured in a foreign country, and they struck up a conversation. And Nehemiah raised the question, how are things back in Jerusalem? Haven't heard from the city. Haven't heard from a few people that still remain there. What's going on? What does the city look like? And the individual said to Nehemiah, the people in Jerusalem who are left are in great affliction. The walls of the city... He said, they have been destroyed. They've been burned to the ground. The temple is gone, the place of worship. The city has been ravaged. From our perspective, the city of Jerusalem would look like a war zone. And Nehemiah loved the city of Jerusalem. That was home for him. And the Bible says in the first chapter of the book of Nehemiah, when he heard about the devastation of the homeland, he did three or four things. And if you'll notice in verse number four, we're told what he did. The Bible said when he thought about the tragedy of Jerusalem, that he sat down and the first thing he did was he began to weep. His heart was broken. He couldn't comprehend the fact that such devastation had taken over, such devastation had brought destruction to the homeland, and he began to weep over it. But this verse says that not only did he weep, he mourned. And he mourned certain days. Now the word mourning there would be like somebody, we would say today they're wailing. Uh, they're beyond crying. Uh, there is a tone in their voice that would remind you of pain and anguish and agony that's coming forth from them because of the destruction of Jerusalem. And it's not just a momentary brokenness. It is a brokenness that is lasting for hours and Eventually, he's lasting for days because of the, the total destruction that's been brought upon the homeland. 
He wept. He mourned. The difficulty had taken his appetite away from him. The Bible said that he fasted. He done without food. He done without drink. He is so tore up. He is so downcast that so much tragedy could happen to such a beautiful city as Jerusalem. In those days, the defense of any city would be the high walls. They would have guards to stand on the walls, to watch out uh, outside of the city, to warn people of the enemy coming. And it was difficult for the enemy to, uh, to conquer a town as long as those walls are in place. But now their defense is gone. The walls are destroyed. The city is burned. And way off in a foreign country, here's a man who's weeping. He's moaning. He's doing without food. And the Bible says he's praying. He's praying for some kind of solution to this problem. He's asking God, how can the city be restored? How can the walls be rebuilt? He's devastated. He's overcome. He don't know what to do. He's driven to prayer. He's driven to the presence of God because he believes that there has to be a solution. And the only way that solution can be wrought is if God intervenes and he, Nehemiah, is willing to be a subject in the hands of his master to try to rebuild these walls and rebuild the city. The king recognized that the countenance of Nehemiah was fallen and he inquired about what the problem was and Nehemiah poured his heart out to the king and the king gave him leave that he might be able to go back to Jerusalem and do something to rebuild the walls of the city. Now I want to hurriedly move through our text to get you to the text I read. But Nehemiah came back. And one of the first things Nehemiah did in chapter number 2, and down about verse number 13, he got on a beast, and he rode out that evening through the devastation. He went through the gates that had fallen down. He took a survey of the city. He even went into some of the arenas of the city where there was so much rubbish the animal beneath him could not go through the rubbish and go around the rubbish. And he had to turn around. And he had to go in other directions to look over the city. To try to figure out what could be done to rebuild the homeland. Word got out that Nehemiah was back. And the purpose of his return was to do something to trust God to rebuild the city. And when the word got out that he was back to rebuild the city, the enemies raised up against him. Look in chapter number 2, please, of the book of Nehemiah and verse number 10, that when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there came a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. They said, hey, we don't want this wall, these walls rebuilt. We don't want the city rebuilt. And they made fun of Nehemiah. They made fun of his efforts. In chapter 4, in verse number 3, here's what they said. They said, this building process that you're trying to get in place, why, even if a fox went up and jumped against this wall you're going to build, it would fall down. They made fun of him. All of hell was assailing against him. But if you'll notice in your Bibles in chapter 4, verse number 17, they began the building process. And here's the way it happened. 
In chapter 4, verse number 17, They which build it on the wall, and they that bear burdens, and those that laden every one with one of his hands, wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. They said, now the, the enemy out here is going to try to attack us. So they did what has been called building and battling. And they said now, as we build this wall and we hear that Sanballat and Tobiah and the enemies and Geshem and all these others, they want to stop the building of the wall. If we see them coming, if we hear they're coming, we're going to blow the trumpet on the wall. And when you hear the trumpet blown, everybody stop what you're doing. Bring your weapons and come right here and we will fight the enemy together. In other words... We're going to have a trowel in one hand. We're putting concrete in the wall with one hand. We've got a sword in the other hand. And we're going to make sure this job gets completed. The enemy is going to do everything they can to stop it. And Nehemiah is depending upon the Lord to give them victory. One of the things that is so encouraging throughout the book of Nehemiah is Nehemiah's total dependence upon God's ability to use them to accomplish the purpose of rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. And I can honestly say, as I read the book of Nehemiah, and as you would take time to read the book of Nehemiah, even in the building and even in the opposition of the enemy, they are experiencing a great movement of God. The presence of God is real. The presence of God is bringing the enemy's advancement to naught. And the city, the people who've come back, they are working in unison to build the wall around the city of Jerusalem. Turn back to the second chapter for just a moment and notice how constantly Nehemiah trusts the Lord for the building process. 2.20, then answered I them and said unto them, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will arise and build. He's talking to the enemy, but you have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. He said, the God of heaven will prosper us. Now, my friend, when you realize that under adverse circumstances, there is a God in heaven who is able to take charge of the situation, bring the counsel of the enemy to know, get the building program done, that his name may be exalted once again through the worship in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, in spite of the odds, in spite of the difficulties, you're still trusting God. You can't see victory, but you know through Christ you're going to have victory, and you just keep trusting him, and you keep plowing on and you keep doing what's right because you know the end results are going to be victory. My friend, you're living in a state of revival in your soul when you don't see impossibilities, you see possibilities. Look in Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse number 15. It came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us. Watch this. And God had brought their counsel to naught that we returned all of us to the wall, every one unto his work. Now look with me in the sixth chapter hurriedly. I'm just hitting the highlights to get to our text. But look with me in the sixth chapter, if you will, and notice with me verse number 15. So the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month Elu in 50 and 2 days. Notice what happened. The enemy fought against them. God fought against the enemy. Now that's the way you win. The enemy fought against them. God fought against the enemy. And God helped them to conserve the people working. Gave them wisdom as to what to do. And in spite of the opposition, Nehemiah just kept on calling on God. Nehemiah kept on believing God. And he said, Lord, it don't look good, but you look good. And as long as you're okay, we're okay. And he just kept on trusting the Lord. And in 50 some days, they rebuilt that wall. God came on board. Now, when you get the wall rebuilt, it's time to experience revival. 
it's time to call a meeting. And this time we're not calling a meeting to figure out how we're going to deal with the enemy. This time we're not calling a meeting to figure out how we're going to finish building the wall. All of that's done been taken care of. We're going to take some time now with God. God's been good to us uh, and we recognize his goodness. So we're going to take a little time now and we're going to worship God. We're going to praise God. We're going to fellowship with God. We're going to have a revival uh, uh, because God uh, has done something for us that deserves and desires our attention. Now, I want you to notice with me, please, in the eighth chapter, that revival begins to break out at the water gate. God's been good to them. May I just pause a minute and say to us in this building today and those listening to my voice outside of this building, that God has been good to us. You know, we take, we take the blessings of God so lightly. Do you know that, and it's hard for us to comprehend this. Do you know that all over the world, right now as we worship in this building, there's little kids with their ribs showing that don't know where the next meal is going to come from. There's parents... That's weeping over the fact they can't provide food for their children. And the best they hope to live in is some limbs leaning up against each other. Tree branches around it. Sleeping on the dirt ground. You say, I, I don't know about the little folks. It's happening. I've been in third world countries. I know it. I've seen it personally. I have, I have pictures in my mind this morning that I'll never, I'll never be able to erase. Little kids standing on dirt grounds uh, in a little lean-to shack uh, with their ribs showing, uh, just barely have enough clothes to cover their body uh, and uh, don't know where the next meal's coming from. And here we are. We've got food in the pantry. We've got food in the refrigerator. We got up this morning and had to choose which dress uh, or which suit or which outfit to put on. And many instances we had to choose uh, which pair of shoes was going to put on. Uh, we got in an automobile, which many people in the world don't have the privilege of owning. Uh, we came to a beautiful building on beautiful property to worship the living God, uh, which multitudes of people in the world uh, don't have. Uh, multitudes of people in the world uh, today will be suffering and there'll be no matter medical facilities to help them. They'll be thirsty and there's nothing to get to drink uh, and they're hurting uh, and uh, they're in total poverty. Uh, and here we are in America. We have been blessed beyond measure. Our blessings are more than we can enumerate. Our blessings are more than we can count. And it seems in spite of all of the blessings of God upon our lives, we find ourselves still disgruntled and never satisfied and murmuring and complaining about what we don't have and we forget what we do have. If there's anybody in the world that ought to be grateful and experiencing revival down in our souls because of the goodness of God, it's we Americans. Thank God for that. They're thankful for what God's done for them, their testimony. And the testimony of God has been established back in the city of Jerusalem. And the people come together. Now, wait a minute. Ezra the scribe went back some 12 to 14 years to Jerusalem before Nehemiah ever got there. And he's the one that's going to handle the word of God. And after they get the walls up and they start rebuilding the city, I want you to notice what happens in verse number 1. The people, not Ezra the scribe, not the preacher. The people come together and they said, hey, Ezra, we want to hear from God. Would you get the word of God? Hey, Ezra, would you read to us out of the word of God? Wow. Isn't that amazing? Now, why would they want Ezra to read the word of God to them? 
because they didn't go to the local bookstore and buy a Bible. If you'll notice, he said, read to us the word of Moses. Now, that would be the first five books of the Bible, the, what we call the Pentateuch, five books of the Bible. Uh, they didn't have a lot of the Old Testament scriptures. They didn't have a full Bible like you have in your lap this morning. The only Bible they could hear was the Bible that was read there to Watergate. And they wanted to hear from God. Think about that. They had a hunger for the Word of God. I was thinking yesterday and this morning, and I, I did not do a survey, but I got to thinking about how many Bibles I have in my home. And I've got a whole shelf full in my office. Several of them are worn out. And I got to thinking, I've probably got eight or 10 or 12 Bibles at my house. And many of them are there because my dear, darling wife, every time she'd go to the bookstore and she'd go to a Bible conference or the sword conference, uh, she'd come home with a new Bible. And I'd say, uh, Linda, you've got Bibles, but I like this one. And I just got, I've, I've got a lot of Bibles at home. You've probably got more than one Bible at your house. And the problem is we've got all of these Bibles around that can help us, but we spend more time in front of the television than we do getting help from God from His Word. Yeah. To these people, the Word was important. They didn't have a copy of the Word. And I've watched them through the years visiting. I, I don't know why this comes back to my memory, but the first church I ever pastored way out in the country. I'd go in their home and uh, sit in the living room and I had this big family Bible on the coffee table. And it was a glass top and they'd have this big family Bible there. And I'd get ready to leave many times. I'd say, uh, how about me reading some scripture and having prayer with you before I leave? Yes, preacher, we would love for you to do it. Many instances they would say, oh, we was going to ask you if you'd read some scripture and pray with us before you go. And I'd pick the Bible up to try to find some scripture uh, to read to the family. <clears throat> and I got covered up with information placed in the depository of the scriptures. I mean, everybody who had died in the community, they had cut their obituary out of the paper and it was in the Bible. Everybody that got married, their wedding announcement was in the Bible. I remember on one occasion opening the Bible up and there is a four-leaf clover pressed between two pieces of wax paper in the Bible. Birth announcements, birthdays, anniversaries, all of it included the purpose of the Bible. It was a safe to put memorabilia in. How many of you understand the Bible is not a place for us to store our memories. It's a place for us to get help from heaven. And we ought to love that book. We ought to reverence that. Here's the people coming to Ezra and they're saying, hey, read to us the Bible. We want to hear from heaven. We want God to speak to us. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? I want you to notice that when Ezra stood up and started reading the Bible, strange things happened down there in Jerusalem. First of all, Baptists, time was of no essence. My dear Baptists, Look at verse number three. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand and the ears of all of the people were attentive unto the book of the law. They started reading. Ezra started reading the scripture. 
early in the morning. He's still reading the Bible at noon. And everybody is still attentive at 12 o'clock, just like they were attentive when he started reading the scriptures. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Someone asked a lady in a church one time, how do you like your new pastor? She said, I don't like him much. He preaches so long, I couldn't stay awake, and he hollered so loud, I couldn't sleep. They're getting immersed and saturated in the Word of God. Folk, you can't put nothing in your mind of more value than God's Word. They said, hey, we, we don't have the Word of God. We want the Word of God. And they listen all morning long. And as you read this chapter, it was very interesting how they handled the Word of God. Ezra's up here reading. They position people around those people while he's reading. And somebody would raise their hand and they'd say, Ezra, we don't understand what you've just read. Can you explain it to us? And they'd have somebody standing over there that would explain to the people what Ezra just read. All morning long, they'd say, what does that mean? And somebody would explain the scriptures to them. They were hungry not only to hear, they were hungry to know, listen, how the Word of God applied to their individual lives. It was important to them. And they were attentive. But I want you to notice something. I want you to note with me how the Bible affected these people. First of all, the Bible says in verse number 5 that Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people, for he was above the people. And when he opened the book, notice this, the people stood up. Where do we get this thing from in here when we read the scriptures? We stand right here. You know why they stood? They stood out of respect for the Word of God, and they stood in reverence to the Word of God. You know why? It wasn't just an ordinary book. Do you know if the governor of the state of North Carolina, I'd rather say the lieutenant governor, came in this building, or the president came in this building this morning, do you know what we do? Everybody do it. We stand up. Why do we do that? We stand up, to revere the fact that here is an important person coming into our building. When Ben Carson was running for president of the United States, he came by here. Our choir was full, our balcony was full, our auditorium was full, we had out extra chairs, the church was filled. And I'll never forget, when he came in the door, right here on my left, everybody stood. And we applauded. And when he came to the pulpit, we stood. Why did we do that? Here's a person aspiring for the highest office of the land. And out of respect for his willingness to do that, we stood up and we applauded him. Why do we stand up when the Word of God is being read? Because we don't receive the Word of God as the Word of men. This is, in fact, the very words of God himself. Uh, this is his inspired, inerrant, forever settled Word. Other people may try to change it and other people may they have ideas about it and question it. But this is the Word of God. And when this book is opened at Berean Baptist Church, we stand up because we reverence the fact, we revere the fact that we want God to revive us through His living Word. And we respect this book as the very words of the living God. Now, if you don't think they started having revival, I want you to watch this. Ezra's reading, people are standing, they're attentive, and they're standing from morning to noon because the Word of God is being read. Now notice, again, my dear Baptist brethren and sisters, notice with me again that one of the signs of revival that we find here at the Watergate is not only a love for God's Word, not only the fact that they are attentive to the Word of God. Not only that they want to stand up out of appreciation to the Word, the unchanging Word of God. 
But they kind of got beside themselves. Let me say it this way. They got the starch kind of knocked out of them. I want to say it again. They kind of got the starch knocked out of them. I want to say it again in case you didn't hear my first two times. They kind of got the starch knocked out of them. You say, well, I like dignity. You see it all the time when you go to the funeral home. You'll see it. They can fix you up, put the colored lights on you. You're talking about dignity. They can make you look dignified. But they're dead. Man, we can come and look dignified. We can put on our hearts, shafter and marks, forsums. Uh, I mean, we can get it all. We can put on the rouge and the makeup and cover all the blemishes and get every hair in place, get our shoes shined, uh, get an expensive tie and hang around our neck and be as dead as four o'clock. There ought to be some kind of spiritual movement when we come in contact with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the power of His Word. There ought to be something that would move something down in our soul to let us know we're plugged into something greater than we are. You say, well, I'm afraid if I say amen it may bother somebody. Yeah, it may wake somebody up. But notice what they did. When the Word of God was being proclaimed, not only did they stand, but in verse number 6, Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all of the people answered, Amen. But they didn't say it one time. They said, Amen. Yeah. Amen. Your wife says, honey, will you take the garbage out? Yes, ma'am. Jesus died for you. You can go to heaven someday. Really? That's what our attitude sometimes says. Look, we should never get tired of the old, old story. But Jesus loves us. The songwriter said it to the kids. But so, no, so, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. I ought to be excited about somebody that loves me as much as he loved me. Did you get excited the first time you had a date with your now wife? Did you get excited when you had your first date with your now husband? You say, no, not really. He just had to grow on me. I doubt that. I remember being in high school, and this gal in my class had met this guy from another school in a basketball game we'd had, and he kind of looked at her like, I really like you, and she looked back and said, thank you for liking me. And he handed that gal a picture of himself, and he was a handsome dude. I will now, I don't know why I remember this, but I remember in the lunchroom that day when we went to lunch, she got her, she's got her plate with her food still on the tray. And I noticed she wasn't eating. She was just like, she was like she was in another world. She had her face cupped against her hand and she's looking down at the tray and I wonder what in the world does she see? It's got her, and right beside of her plate was a picture of that boy. She flipped out over him. Hadn't even dated him yet. And if you think that's something, I'm going to confess my sins. And I wish you had time to confess yours. But I had this gal I really liked in school. I shouldn't say this. I wanted her to like me. I didn't want it to be a one-way street. I wrote her a letter. I said, I love you. Do you love me? I put it in an envelope. I took my lunch money out and put it in there. I tried to buy her love. <laughs> Biggest mistake I ever, ma ever made. She took my lunch money and got with another guy. Bought his lunch, I guess. I don't know. 
I'm just here to tell you that there are things that gets us excited. And most of the things, you get new leather. That's Greek for a new car. You get new leather. You say, man, I love to smell this new leather. How many of you know the new leather gets old? Everything down here in this world that excites us is short-lived. Oh, but if you know Jesus as your Savior, that's not short-lived. That's an eternal relationship. That is an eternal Lord. That is an eternal Savior. I'm not going to hell, hallelujah. I'm not going to have to die and scream forever. I'm going to be able to meet my loved ones, see my Savior, walk the streets of glory. I'm going to be in His presence one of these days because He went to Calvary to forgive me my sins. I've got something to say amen about. And so do you, if you're saved. They said, Amen. Amen. You say, Preacher, you don't know how it strains me to say Amen. Yeah, I do too. I probably know as much about it as you do. I don't hear much of it. But we need to learn to say Amen. It's in the Bible. It's not going to hurt you. If you have problems with it in church, I would say this. When your wife says, honey, will you take the garbage out? You say to her, amen. (laughs) Honey, will you go to the grocery store? Amen. Just start one-on-one. Start with your husband or start with your wife. It means let it be so. Just learn to say amen. Amen. When your soul gets stirred and you get to thinking about what it means to be saved, you ought to want to say, Amen. Amen. The Word of God's being read. And they're saying, Amen. Oh. But it gets worse for some Baptists. Because not only did they get so revived, it didn't bother them to say, Amen. Amen. They held their hand up. Notice. I'm not making this up. Look at chapter 8, verse number 6. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen. And they lifted up their hands. And they bowed. Watch this. They, They bowed their heads. And they worshiped the Lord. He said, Preacher, I just don't believe in raising my hand. I know. I'm just telling you what they did when they got revived. He said, I'm afraid somebody might think bad of me. What do you think God thinks when he looks down at us after redeeming us? And we sit as dead as corpses with no emotion? You've heard me say this before. I think it merits saying it again. I don't know how in this world some Baptists ever get married. I don't know. I mean, you ask you why. Uh, honey, I believe you are the one for me. I, I, I've enjoyed our time together and I prayed about this. And I just believe that I'd like to spend the rest of my life with you. Honey, would you marry me? Well, I don't know. I'll think about it. I guarantee you, she wouldn't be sitting beside you today. You'd have gone home with a, or somebody would have gone home with a knot on their head. I asked my dear wife, first time out, I'll never forget this. I said, what are you planning on doing the rest of your life? She had a piece of steak on the end of her fork, ready to put it in her mouth. And I popped that question, what are you planning on doing the rest of your life? She threw that steak down in that plate and she looked at me with fire piercing in her eyes. And she said, I want you to understand something. I'm not desperate. Six months later, she said, I do. She was desperate and didn't know it. 
Look, when you love something, are you love? You know what some people do? They show more affection to a puppy dog in the backyard than they do to Jesus when they're worshiping him. Come here, Fido. Come here. Uh, put your head here on my knee and you rub them and you say, oh, give me howdy. Lay down, turn over. Oh, and the neighbor, oh, and you say, isn't that so cute? You come to church and the preacher says, you know something, you're not going to have to go to hell. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he'll forgive you of your sins. And the, and the thing that people down here fuss and fight and kill over gold, we're going to walk on that up there in, the, in heaven. And the people sit there and say, my bull of us says it's time to go. Man, we ought to be excited. And we ought to let it know, be known by saying, hey, when he got up to read the Bible, they didn't have it. When he got up to read it, they said, Amen. And they held their hands up. Now, if you hold your hands up, don't worry about the people that don't. And if you don't hold your hand up, don't worry about the people that do. There ought to be expression in our relationship with the Lord. Revival means expression comes forth. You've heard me talk about the Welch revival called fire zones where there was so much emotion. It's just like the place is on fire and people are standing up and they're testifying and they're singing and they're praising and they're staying hours at a time. And hundreds of people are walking the aisles and joining the churches. What happened? They fell in love with Jesus and they expressed their love outwardly because inwardly he had made a difference in their lives. Amen. Amen. They lifted up their hands in worship. And lastly, I'm not finished. I'm just, this is to make you feel better. Lastly, verse number nine. Look at the last part. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Has the word of God ever been so real to you that you just looked up to heaven and said, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your promises. Have you ever thought where you'd be if you didn't have the word of God? Just think about having never been exposed to the scriptures. You wouldn't know what salvation consists of. You wouldn't know what happens to your loved ones when, you, when they leave us. You wouldn't know any of that. You wouldn't know about heaven. You wouldn't know about any of that. You wouldn't know how to be saved if we didn't have this blessed book in front of us. This is the most important commodity, commodity you have outside, outside of your salvation. And they loved us so much they started weeping over it. Lastly, I'll never forget years ago, back in the late 70s, as well as I remember, I flew with Brother Gene Davis, who's now in, who, he's in heaven, and five other preachers. We flew out of West Palm Beach, Florida, and flew down to uh, Port-au-Prince and Cape Haitian. And Brother Davis had a huge box of tracts printed in their language, Creole. And it was about 10 30, 11 o'clock at night, and he got to thinking. He said, You know, I forgot to get those, I forgot to get those tracks out of the airplane. So we're up on the side of this beautiful mountain there in Haiti at a huge motel. Had orange trees, I remember, around the pool and all kinds of fruit. And it's a beautiful place. And he borrowed a little old Datsun truck. I'll never forget this. He borrowed a Datsun truck that the motel owned to go out to the airport to get those tracks. And all, all six of us preachers got in the back of that little Datsun truck. Now, the other preacher is about the same size I am, one larger than me. I mean, we look like the jolly green giant sitting in that little bitty Dodson truck. I'll never forget, we drove out to the airport. Now, the airport there at that time was a little old shanty. 
Brother Davis drove up and the lights shined in that thing and the door came open and here came a Haitian soldier out with an M1 rifle. He was saying something. I had no idea what he was saying uh, as far as words, but I knew what he meant. And Brother Davis introduced himself and I'll never forget that soldier said, Oh, Mr. Davis. I said, Hallelujah. That's when you say Amen. We got that box of tracks, and I'll never forget it. We went back up near the motel, Cape Haitian. 12 o'clock, after 12 o'clock, after midnight. And we sat in the back of the truck, and we started handing those tracks out. I want you to hear me. We were literally stampeded. People came out of the woodwork everywhere begging for one of those tracks. They're lined up around that little truck. I've never seen anything like it. And they're reaching over other people trying to get a track. And they didn't do like people in America do, throw it on the street or throw it in the trash can. I looked out and I couldn't believe it. Under the street lights, these Haitians have got that little track and they're sitting on the sidewalk and they've got it opened up under the street lights after midnight and they're reading the Word of God. They were hungry. Yeah. And you hand the Word of God out to people in America and they wind it up and throw it in a trash can, hand it back to you and say, I'm saved, I don't need it, hand it to somebody else and throw it in the trash can. And we've got the most important commodity right here in front of us, the Word of God, and we treat it so carelessly. They had revival. And the revival brought emotion. They said, we want God to know we love you. Amen. Hallelujah. My friend, revival means that we fall in love all over again with the Savior of our soul. And we don't take what he's done for us lightly. They had revival at the water gate. There's so much more I can say. We're going to stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Let me ask you today in view of the revival here at the Watergate. Let me ask you today. How precious is Jesus to you? How important is Jesus to you? How wonderful is Jesus to you? Have you grown cold in your relationship with him? Is he as important as he ought to be in your life? Are you grateful and thankful and appreciative for his grace and his mercy and his love and his compassion and his care for you? Oh, we ought to get around this altar today and say, God, renew my commitment. Lord, I want you to know that I love you supremely. I want you to know that in my life, I love you so much. I thank you for loving me. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not going to have to die and go to hell. Thank you, Lord, for taking me into consideration. Thank you, Lord, for the roof over my head. Thank you, Lord, for the clothes on my body. Thank you, God, for the Bible that I have in front of me. Thank you, God. Thank you for all of your blessings. Father, help us today to be appreciative and thankful and help us to open up our minds and our heart and our soul as expressions of love and appreciation to you for all you mean to us in Jesus' name. We sing this stanza if others need to come. Would you come?